Kohima during World War II was in 2013 picked as Britain's greatest battle over other more famous battles that happened in continental Europe, such as Waterloo, or even Operation Overlord that began on June 6, 1944, just two days after the end of Battle of Kohima. The Nagas were integral to Britain's victory at the Battle of Kohima, and today the print is launching His Majesty's Headhunters, published by Penguin India in the print softcover. I have the book here with me. The author is Monlumo Kikon. He's joining us to discuss the role played by the Nagas in a siege that shaped world history. Welcome, sir, to the print soft cover. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Sir, to get right into the questions. The history of the Naga tribes and the British, as you write in part one of your book, was not always friendly. In fact, the British, for about almost 46 years, had multiple incursions into Naga territory that didn't always end with peace. It was a lot of bloodshed, right? Thousands of headhunters were massacred. But in 1944, at the Battle of Kohima, right, the Nagas were integral to the British victory. What were the roles played by the Nagas during this battle and what led to this change within a century that saw the Nagas integral to a British victory at this battle, sir? Like uh, with all the colonial subjects of the British Empire, you would see the first interaction has been mostly violent. So the period in which uh, the Nagas resisted the occupation or the uh, uh, you know uh, attack by the British uh, army, initially uh, the British East India Company, then after fifty seven the British government. Uh, so a uh, violent engagement between the two uh, groups. The Nagas were interested in uh, the regular expedition to, you know, up to Silet, in, which is now Bangladesh. Uh, but then uh, at that point of time, part of the British East India Company's, uh, you know, empire, uh, to trade in slaves, salt, and, and uh, also uh, these regular expeditions were carried out and it, it actually impacted the uh, resource mobilization, revenue generation of the British East India Company. So they had no uh, uh, intention to go and uh, establish political headquarters in the Naga Hills. And they were curious about why they were uh, you know, coming down to the valley for the regular uh, incursions and, and incursions into uh, the British economic interests. At that point of time, uh, interactions were... Uh, as I already said, uh, limited to the skirmishes between the Nagas and uh, the, the, the so-called subject of the British uh, East India Company. And that was when uh, the British decided that, uh, uh, and this was larger part of the British Empire to expand to China, get into uh, easier trade routes towards Burma and um, exploit the natural resources available there in uh, mostly Cabo Valley as well. And uh, from further on, they had this uh, idea of uh, getting towards uh, the Chinese market via the shorter route. Uh, initially, uh, they were using the Silchar route. Sil there was no Silchar then, of course. Uh, the Kacha the kingdom towards uh, Manipur, but it was a long route. You know, this is after 1826 when the Treaty of Yandabu was signed, if you would uh, remember. So they had actually signed this treaty and uh, they brought a uh, larger part of Burma under there. Uh, rule after that because they have chased away and defeated uh, Burmese, uh, uh, the Burmese in Assam and Manipur. And in Manipur, particularly, the, the uh, British uh, started what is called the Manipur Levy. Uh, it was then uh, the uh, Maharaja Gambir Singh of Man uh, Manipur. So they used uh, Maharaja Gambir Singh uh, by uh, establishing this levy. And uh, later on, this levy chased away the Burmese in uh, Manipur. Which Burmese were chased away from Manipur uh, using this levy. So at that point of time, the British wanted, like I said, a shorter route. The only route possible, uh, and which was suggested to them by uh, the Maitis as well, was the route from uh, Dimapur to Imfa via Kohima. So uh, the Naga Hills, as it is, were uh, an area they have not uh, entered. They have never dared to go beyond Dimapur. Dimapur, again, because... Uh, the Kachari kingdom was there before in the 16th century, before they were chased away by the uh, home kings. 
So they decided that they would uh, seek a new route. They sent uh, the political officers in 1832 along with the Manipuri levy. That's how the expedition began. They went from Kachar to Imphal and from Imphal, Imphal they came up to the Naga Hills, uh, especially Kohima and uh, on, onwards to Dimapur. So I look at how uh, this journey took them 46 years of uh, you know incessant warfare and uh, there were like at least five shift in the British East India Company and the British government's policy towards the Naga Hills, whether they would interfere, whether they would go and have direct rule, whether they should go and establish their political headquarters. So these were questions which actually they were uh, toying with. And in Kolkata, they had uh, several discussions uh, on this matter. And in 1878, uh, mm, they decided that they will establish a political administrative headquarters in 19. 1878 in Kohima, because they realized that uh, uh, a very uh, defensive or non-intrusive policy would not help their agenda. The agenda being uh, revenue and resource uh, generation. So they saw this as an opportunity to further go to uh, towards Burma and also to um, have an easy route towards Imphal so that, you know, in the future they would be able to go for it. Coming forward to 1944, uh, you are asking the right question because nobody's actually addressed this question of how a uh, hostile, uh, very uh, unfriendly natives had challenged the British Empire's agenda of expansion and how this has never been recorded in uh, the history of India and how this anti-colonial uh, fight movement has been one of the toughest in terms of how using just the Tao and the spear uh, the, the Nagas good with their ferocity and, and uh, stratagem fight and resist the British army for 46 years. So uh, there was one aspect of it which interested me, especially to, to the use of weaponry by the British. They used mortars, you know, cannons and uh, Enfield rifles, whereas the Nagas were using, uh, you know, uh, later on they used a muzzle-loading gun. Uh, if you would see a picture in the book, you would see me holding a big gun. It's a long gun. So, you know, there were tall soldiers and, uh, sorry, warriors, uh, which resisted the British uh, uh, army. Uh, the curiosity emerged because they were using, um, you know, just uh, enough sufficient modern weaponry to uh, go and subdue the Naga headhunters. And um, when the Second World War, Okay. The Nagas themselves were, you know, surprised by by the weaponry used in the war. You know, the amount of uh, aeroplanes that came, then bombs that were dropped, the amount of destruction they saw within their own uh, with their own eyes. You know, the whole of Kohima village was uh, destroyed, and and you would see a lot of people dying, and. Uh, Ultimately, the entire Naga area towards uh, Myanmar, the route towards Myanmar from Kohima, you will see bodies of Japanese soldiers strewn about, uh, which is uh, remarkable because many people, especially uh, my grandfather's generation, remember the, the escape or uh, the Japanese soldiers going back, running away from the battle after they surrendered in a way. So this sort of uh, made me think about how... You know, the question that you were asking, how it developed from, uh, you know, uh, atmosphere of hostility to uh, something very unlikely to an atmosphere of cooperation. So it came about uh, because after the political headquarters was uh, established in Kohima in uh, 1878, they, the Britishers decided that, uh, you know, using force was not the way to engage the Nagas. But more so, understanding them and uh, studying their culture and their behaviors and uh, establishing a very indirect sort of administration would bring about uh, the, the natives to their fault. Um, if you would remember, you know, the, the administrators chosen by the British Empire at that time, especially the colonial bureaucrats, were of uh, different mold. I mean, we were told that in the universities they were uh, studying only uh, 
the ancient uh, text of Plato, Aristotle, you know, and all uh, great political scientists of the past. And that was the only training they had. And when they were sent, they, they were looking at how uh, flexible the empire can be in terms of uh, uh, their attempts to colonize the people there or, or the uh, natives that they were in touch with. So I, if you remember, the almost all the political officers called deputy commissioners sent by the British Empire or the British government were uh, also anthropologists were social scientists and uh, therefore uh, they, they you know had some sort of empathy towards their subject because they're studying them as well as governing them so that particular i think uh, aspect of the character of the bureaucrats enabled the britishers to sort of establish a relation with uh, the naga headhunters and so when it came to 1944 Nagas were already used to two things. One, uh, you know, hundreds of Nagas had gone to France for the First World War as uh, labor corps. So they were already used to a great world war, a battle which, uh, uh, in which they have seen uh, weapons that they have never seen in their lives being used for war. So that was an exposure which, uh, in fact, uh, gave them political consciousness some sort of uh, identity-based uh, uh, sub-nationalism and the ideas of freedom uh, that they sort of imbibe from there. And they started uh, political organizations. Uh, pol- uh, and then and the main organization was the Naga Club. So, you know, political consciousness started. Uh, and when 1944 happened, uh, they actually were caught unaware. Prior to that, because of the Burma campaign of the British, you know, after winning, uh, you know, the fight in what is called the uh, famous Wingate's uh, victory in Myanmar, in the Arakan Basin, they were now convinced that they can uh, overtake or uh, overthrow the Japanese in Burma. So the entire Burma campaign was also at the time when I think. Uh, the British Empire's end was coming. At least uh, it was at the fake end of their rule. And I think, you know, if you look at all these factors, you would see that uh, the Nagas were a natural ally for the Britishers because they have been engaging with them at small levels of governance. And uh, this is the village level. And also, uh, in terms of uh, the preparedness, I think the charisma and the you know, the reach of the present, the then Deputy Commissioner, Charles Pauci, is, is, uh, has to be considered as one of the main factors because he had this network of uh, Naga chieftains and you know, the major mm-hmm. groups then. So that was how he was able to mobilize. But uh, to the advantage of the British uh, and the Allied forces, when the Japanese came, they were of the opinion because they had already won uh, battles in Singapore, Malaysia, and they're coming uh, to Burma, they were already governing. So their plan, even though because of the uh, fact that it was a military plan, they, they, the generals were not in agreement. General Sato had some issues uh, over uh, the, you know, the supplies. Because without adequate supplies, they would not be able to sustain a campaign. The other, uh, Issue which he had was uh, the fact that they should have attacked Dimapur, where the railway station was, uh, but they did not aim for that. So their main task was to uh, take over Kohima, that also a very small portion, just a reach actually, and from there proceed towards Imfa, so that the uh, incoming soldiers, Japanese soldiers from Myanmar, will meet at Imfa and they'll take over Imfa. So. That was the main uh, agenda. So in the process, when they had lesser supplies, they thought that they will rely on the uh, locals. And then the agenda or the idea they had was also the narrative they pushed was that since we look alike, we are Mongoloids, we are Mongoloids, so we are brothers. So we should be helping each other. Whereas Nagas are by culture, you know, uh, we, we practice Jum cultivation and in Kohima there was terrace cultivation. The Japanese were, uh, you know, of uh, they, they were under a king, emperor, 
and their civilization was uh, much developed in a way, you know, and we are uh, hill tribes and our culture was also very different, although we may have looked at it. So I think at that point of time, the, they did not imagine that the uh, Nagas will resist. Although there has been a relative peace for, you know, uh, better part of the uh, 20th century, uh, when they came, and started uh, because the supplies came late. The, they were short of supplies, and the, when the battle actually started, uh, they had to rely on the local, you know, uh, produce. And uh, initially, they started buying with their money. They had the Japanese currency also, uh, yes. the Japanese rupee, as they called it. But uh, later on, uh, they ran short of that as well. So, yes. in the, uh, uh, by force of uh, compulsion. They committed a very critical mistake by infringing on the rights of the Naga people by stealing their foods. And which is the main thing, you know, when you steal your granary, everything about a Naga village is uh, based on uh, your land as your identity and your granary as your subsistence. Yes. So, yeah. Short, in a brief manner, I would like to sum it up this way, that they actually encroach on that idea of, uh, you know, uh, guest uh, by the host called the Nagas. Yes, and, and, and you brought up a very interesting point there, and which you also write about, is that <clears throat> the plans of Lieutenant General uh, Renia Mutaguchi, as well as Lieutenant General uh, Kotoko Sato of the Japanese army, relied on the fact that the, the supplies would come from the local people based on this premise that they would come in as some sort of liberator, right? They came in with that confidence that they would be accepted, right? From where did the Japanese army get this confidence to carry out their plans with the lives of 100,000 men or more based on this premise that, you know, because we're coming in as liberators, the locals will rise up and support us against the British, which seemed a key pillar of their campaign in uh, in Imphal and Kohima. So where did the Japanese get this confidence? Sir? As far as uh, literature is available on the debates behind uh, <coughs> the time when they decided on this particular siege or the plan to attack uh, and take over Kohima, it is said that uh, they were of uh, mainly, you know, the opinion that they will go and attack because uh, historically, you know, uh, the entire world war was shaping up, and and they were at a point where they were against the uh, British and the Allied Army, uh, and also, you know, after what what happened in China. Uh, and what was happening in Burma, Burma was critical, but for them to actually take over Kohima men taking over the rest of India. They thought they will go run over Assam and uh, then, then, then thereafter over Bangalore. And that, that way they would uh, actually, uh, you know, they had a perhaps secret agenda of taking over the reins from the British Empire. Uh, but uh, Fed had different uh, thing in store for them. The shock and awe strategy of the Japanese army is something which is uh, unparalleled. In fact, uh, it is written that uh, the Japanese soldiers uh, in any battle, uh, one of them would be equivalent to 10 of the uh, enemy soldiers because of the kind of uh, obstinacy and also, um, you know, the, I mean, the societal tendency of the soldier itself, you know, by... Uh, in the modern parlance, you would uh, be reminded of the jihadis. But in effect, in, in effect uh, they were, you know, willing to sacrifice their life for, for the emperor. And uh, and uh, any belief that they had in their own infallibility, infallibility is something which uh, would remind us of, you know, the false sense of, uh, you know, glory that they might have had over other uh, other enemies or other, you know, soldiers. Um, it is well recorded that they thought that they could anyway, any day defeat the British uh, soldiers there in Kohima because they were few in number. If you remember, initially the Kohima uh, garrison, as they call it, had a few soldiers. 
uh, till they mobilized, you know, when they had, uh, because of Charles Pauci, they had enough spies to tell them that the Japanese were, in, uh, you know, advancing towards Kohima. Otherwise, initially they had small uh, force and they were reinforced later on. So one of, one of the reasons why they were able to defeat uh, the Japanese soldiers. But in a way, you know, they were right that they could go and overrun the place because it was uh, you know, it was not uh, a big garrison and uh, British didn't think much of it. Uh, they were just uh, having a post in the Naga Hills and then uh, they didn't think that the Japanese would come this far. So that way the British, uh, Japanese were right, but uh, like it often happens in history, uh, sometimes you, you miscalculate and this was an... Uh, a story of miscalculation by the Japanese army. And uh, when they came and they were defeated, uh, General Sato had said even till his deathbed, he maintained that uh, General, uh, he was right and uh, his superior was wrong. So, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, if you have read my book, the uh, his boss came to his funeral. Yes. Although he said that, uh, he said good things about Sato in his funeral. He uh, he said that uh, later on, he said that he still holds to his uh, point that Sato was uh, wrong in disobeying, disobeying the orders. So, you know, I just also mentioned, you know, the, the uh, there are certain elements of uh, immortality or uh, invincibility attached to the Japanese soldier. They had the system of harakiri. They had the system of uh, you know doing everything they can to uh, restore the pride of the emperor. So it was more a uh, super you know human soldier uh, attitude, and, and and therefore without proper pre- preparation, also they could be that confident to come and uh, you know, attack uh, the British. Post there in right, sir. And, and that's my last question, actually, uh, brings us to the end of this interview because we've dealt with the, you know, from you, we've heard as to how the Naga cultures viewed the British when they first came. Uh, and very interestingly, because of what, 60, 65 years of working with the British, you know, when push came to shove in 1944, you know, they were integral for. Uh, the defense of the British Empire for His Majesty's Kingdom. Uh, saying that, sir, uh, His Majesty's Head Hunters will be out. It's a wonderful book. It, it gives you an insight you. into how the col- how colonialism worked, uh, but how at the end of the day, the Naga tribes were integral in defending the empire uh, against the invincible Japanese. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, sir and uh, catch the book uh, at any store near you.